Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special. I'm Chris Bishop. I'm talking to Hui Hua Lim. What do you think this economy is doing wrong and what could it do better? The longer you leave it, the bigger the problem and the more difficult it is, uh, if not impossible in some cases. So I think it's good that they have started to think about it seriously. Uh, but how not difficult is it? Because you did exactly the same thing in Singapore that this country is proposing to do with its national power generator, ESCOM, to mm -hmm. divide it up into several units. Mm -hmm. How difficult was that? So I think the processes are not difficult. Uh, what really is required would be, in a way, sanction, uh, a sanctioning of power from the very top. Because you really need the very top levels of um, government to decide that this is what we need, this is what we have to do. And uh, China recognized it and did that uh, with the formation of SESAC uh, when they decided to uh, reform the whole state-owned enterprise sectors. And I, I think political will is extremely important. I know I probably overstate uh, or understate the, the difficulty of uh, doing it, but it, it really is uh, the beginning of everything. Um, and then you go through the hard work of deciding which are the ones that really need immediate help, uh, immediate restructuring. But there are some guiding principles that um, I, I would suggest that uh, you know anyone who is contemplating a transformation of the SOE sector to think about. And that apart from uh, you know giving sort of uh, the blessings from the very top, is actually to look at um, what are the strategic roles that. Uh, SOEs actually perform. A lot of them were actually created with the best of intentions, uh, mainly because there's no private sector player, so market failure. Um, but then they tend to outlive their usefulness. And over time, they also tend to get bloated because they always get bailed out by government. So if they can, um, if any government, I mean, going through the transformation, can identify some of these issues. And, and then, because I think each SOE, as it appears, is at actually at a different point of its uh, journey and um, maybe the things that need to be done actually could be fairly different. Some might have more emphasis on the definition of its mandate, its mission. Some might just need help with uh, some of the processes, I mean, like, um, because some of them are already encountering international competition like the South African Airways. Um, but then, so the kind of support and help that they need uh, to do all the painful and difficult transformation uh, would be quite different across the entire sort of family of SOEs. But how, how difficult a, a job do you think this country, South Africa, has got on its hands? I mean, it's got a, a string of uh, state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are hemorrhaging money. Right. Um, how difficult do you think the job is on the hands from what you're seeing? Um, extremely difficult because you, you almost have to do like 20 things at the same time. You have to revisit the purpose of each you know, SOE. You have to think about the immediate financial redress that you need for the ones that are hemorrhaging very badly. You have to think about the governance structure because you can't implement any reforms unless you've got the right people in place. Uh, so maybe I, I would say that that's actually one of the more important priorities that I would um, you know, suggest. Um, and then you, you have the whole competition, industry competition framework as well. Uh, so it's a lot of things at the same time. Uh, and then in terms of the whole list of SOCs, which are the ones that really badly need attention immediately. Uh, I mean, some have described it as ICU cases. Uh, which are the ones that really require immediate attention? Who are the best persons to execute that? Where is the authority coming from for that transformation? Because if any of these are not clear, uh, it won't happen. Do you think, um, from what you're saying, that the government here is has the will to see this through and the expertise to see what's going to be a very difficult transformation? Mm -hmm. I, I think based on I mean what I read in the media and so on, um, the public and, and the government, uh, the newly elected government, uh, are very cognizant of what needs to be done uh, generally. 
uh, I think people might be a little maybe impatient because they, they go from being angry to being impatient for results. Uh, whereas some of the things that I look at, I mean the issues, I, I don't think they can be fixed overnight. So you, you need to almost like bring everybody on board in terms of the collective vision going ahead, including the public who might be impatient about it. But that's uh, easier said than done here because uh, whereas your country is small, um, this one is very large, mm. but also this one has a very uh, liberal constitution, one of the most liberal constitutions, mm -hmm. everyone has rights here. Um, one of the things that helped your transformation is the fact that um, there are a lot of very strict rules for people mm -hmm. to live by. Um, everything was very ordered, but it's unlikely to be the same here in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think you can, regardless of whether you have uh, strict rules or not, but I think people can be united around a common vision. So uh, in our case, it, it was just survival and growth, economic growth and economic survival. And because we needed to be a trusted hub, so rules are there for a good reason. What about um, the, one of the, the great problems that the government here is grappling with at the moment, corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tremendous clampdown going on. Your country suffered from the same uh, many, many years ago. Um, just give us an idea how Singapore fought uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think where, when we first became independent, we were no less vulnerable than any other economy to corruption and corruption practices. Um, it's just that because we realised that you know nobody would see a reason to stop by Singapore or to do business in Singapore if we were not a trusted uh, hub or centre. Um, so it became the reason for us to want to do that. Uh, and over time, because we have, uh, so we've got heavy penalties. So initially it was really, uh, you know, I mean the, the penalties that cost people to behave. But over time, it's really pretty much, I would say, in the DNA of every Singaporean to frown, if not disapprove completely of uh, any form of bribery, corruption, or just wrongdoing uh, to a same So if you're involved in corruption, no matter how tight your family is, you say that people in your family won't speak to you, is that right? Oh, I would say socially, uh, it's, it's really frowned upon. Um, you will get a lot of disapproval by not just your families but your friends and so on. It's it's just something nobody would in the sort of correct frame of mind would think about doing. And has it divided families in the past? Um, well, I, I would say maybe in the past. I mean, um, people will not want to talk about the, the family member who is being caught. Uh, I mean, things get reported in the papers. I mean, the press about you know who's been charged and caught for corruption and so on, um, people will get really embarrassed about you know, being associated with someone like that. Yeah. And you've got um, this uh, criminal breach of trust law which covers everything mm -hmm. um, for business. Mm -hmm. um, how exactly does that work uh, in terms of uh, not only um, clamping down but also the penalties? How heavy can the penalties be? Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's a whole range of it. But if you embezzle money, then it's obviously a function of how much you have taken. Um, or if you, um, I mean, uh, if you missell a financial services product with a view to cheating. So cheating comes under quite a bit of, uh, I mean, the whole range of penalties that we have as well. Uh, but generally, the, the common thread running through all these uh, different acts and, and or, or bills and legislation is really to say that you just need to behave honestly and with integrity and uh, most Singaporeans will get it I mean it's it's something that we grew up with uh, it's, it's something that we uh, we sort of believe in and, and would live by yeah. correct me if I'm wrong but if if someone was to give a offer a 200 a dollar bribe mm. to a, a government official, you, both of you would end up going to prison. That's right. And if, if, yes, if he collects it, yeah, collects both, it, both, both of, of you will get into trouble. And you could get custodial sentences. For yes, it. yes, yes, yes. And you, looking at this country here, um, you, do you think that this country has got a fighting chance of um, getting rid of corruption? Um, I think if there's a political will to do it, and, and you need almost like a whole 
team of senior enough politicians to want to do it. Uh, it will take time. Uh, if, if China is anything to go by, I mean, they, they've started the process. You make examples of senior enough people and uh, you let people know what the heavy penalties are. Uh, over time, it will permeate down. It, it will take time. And do you think uh, President Sir Ramaphosa, who's now um, trying to uh, start an anti-corruption campaign, do you think he's got what it takes? Well, he, he would certainly, I think, need a lot of support from his fellow cabinet members. Uh, I mean, this, this would take a lot of people who believe uh, in the purpose of reading, you know, the economy. Because in some countries, corruption is fine, it's just a lubricant. So, it's, uh, so you need to change that whole culture as well if you want to get rid of it. And last but not least, um, a lot of people uh, often compare Singapore to South Africa as a, an emerging economy. You work closely with your own economy. What would be the tips you would give to South Africa to help find this elusive growth that uh, it seems to be uh, not able to uh, find at the moment? I actually think you, you have a great amount of resources. I mean, uh, both natural resources and people. Uh, there's no shortage of talent. So it's, I think, the tricky challenge of getting people to all be united around a vision of growing South Africa, of uh, you know, deciding on which areas they can contribute in. Uh, from the government's perspective, then how you can level the playing field, allow the private sector, the private capital to flourish as well. So which will require the sorting out the problems with the state-owned companies as well. Uh, so you almost need to do quite a few things. Finally, um, what um, do you think um, South Africa has going for it economically? And also, what do you think it needs to work on? Uh, what are the problems that need to be tackled? Mm -hmm. um, I think right now the, the government is probably facing a, a bit of a financial crisis and crunch around public funds allocation and so on. So perhaps drawing in private capital might be one way uh, of so in a way, sharing in the growth of the economy. You have a huge abundance of natural resources, wonderful sceneries around the country, <coughs> which I think can be built upon. Um, ultimately, people need to feel like they own the country and they want to have a share in its growth, uh, as well as in its future, obviously. So I think the more you can uh, build a vision around collective responsibility, no doubt dealing with the current issues, but also to move from the current issues, uh, you know, then to further growth. Thank you very much indeed. We have our Lim, the former minister in the Prime Minister's Office of Singapore. Thank you very much for joining me on this CNBC Africa special. From me, Chris Bishop, it's goodbye. Hi, I'm Chris Bishop and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I'm in a luxury Johannesburg hotel in beautiful late autumn sunshine. Now, during South Africa's elections, often the comparison was made between the emerging economy of Singapore and the emerging economy of South Africa and the lessons to be learned between the two. Now, I'm here to meet formerly one of the most powerful people in Singapore. She was a minister in the Prime Minister's office. She worked closely with Lee Kuan Yew, the guiding spirit of Singapore's economy. And she's got a lot of views on how South Africa can reform its economy, how it can deal with its state-owned enterprises, and also how it can fight corruption. She is Hui Hua Lim, a former minister in the office of the Prime Minister of Singapore, who was in Johannesburg to speak at a conference. For seven years, she was one of the most powerful people on the island as a close advisor to Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, the guiding spirit of Singapore's economic revolution. In the 1960s, the island was a rundown port off the southern tip of Malaysia. Now it is a thriving free market economy, believed to be the most open in the world and growing at more than 3%. 
Hui Hua Lim's family reflects this rise. Her parents emigrated to Singapore from China in the 1940s. Her father traded in tea to support her family of 11 who lived in a two-room flat. They grew up to be professionals thanks to the education drive at the heart of Singapore's free market boom. Hui Hua Lim studied at Cambridge, worked in finance before serving in politics for more than 14 years, a world away from her humble beginnings. Most of our parents would have been uh, migrants from either China or India. There was this great emphasis on schooling, education. Um, and when I got a little older, I mean, I started seeing things being built, uh, factories, uh, uh, industrial parks, and then uh, ports, airports, seaports, uh, and a lot of public housing, uh, which, which is sort of the mainstay of the Singapore uh, society. How did you see the economy starting to, to kick off and to love? It happened in, after the country became independent in 1965 under the leadership of Lee Kuan Yew. How, how did you uh, notice the economy transforming in that time? Mm -hmm. So when, um, when we separated from Malaysia and became independent, um, that's like a good six years after the British had left us to self-govern uh, our own, on our own. Um, we basically had nothing because we had no natural resources. Um, the British left uh, with actually a, a big part of the economy when they left. Um, and we had to think around the theme of a global, or rather a, an entrepreneur trading nation and what we can do about it. Uh, and it became quite quickly sort of, uh, obvious to us that we really needed to build around the idea of being a trusted hub. That people would want to stop by Singapore because there was a reason to, because we were different, we were neutral, uh, and we had excellent um, skills that uh, perhaps the neighbourhood didn't quite aggregate in the same fashion as we have and, and most importantly that we were trusted. So um, that it was a place that you would go because there was rule of law and you, could al you would always be correctly treated. Yeah. And um, what kind of industry started springing up as the economy? What, what did the government um, do? to um, try and stimulate and allow the economy to grow? So we were very busy and very focused on attracting foreign direct investments, especially in manufacturing and in all kinds of services, so financial services and so on. Uh, so expanding what the banks were doing, uh, trying to attract foreign banks to set up shop in Singapore. Manufacturing, you'll be getting the multinationals from all over the world to set up a manufacturing base in Singapore. Along with that, um, the government obviously thought through a package of incentives for them um, and the fact that we are a trading hub uh, made the export of goods a lot easier to, you know, to fit into the overall picture as well. And what about labour as well? I mean, in the early days when you were building industry, uh, surely um, there would have been uh, a lot of pressure on wages to try to keep costs down to attract mm -hmm. investment. How did that work with the Singaporean people? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all very relative and there's a context to it because if you think about it, um, a lot of the people who came to Singapore were migrants. So quite a number of them are actually not very well educated to begin with. Uh, they were all literally wanting to just come work in Singapore, roll up the sleeves and do whatever it takes. So to them, employment was everything. Uh, and where you could uh, get jobs, and, and a lot of people work more than one job, where you could get employment that, that was you know, uh, sufficient, that was happy uh, for most people. I mean, that was enough for most people to put food on the table, to have a roof over your head. Um, I, I don't think the concept of uh, getting low wages, I think it's all very relative. Yeah. And uh, what, about, what about unions uh, as the country was going? I mean, uh, one thing South Africa has is very strong unions uh, here, but uh, did, the, did Singapore allow or encourage unions at the time? Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of had a middle ground approach to it. Um, I think unions actually uh, serve a very useful purpose because it represents what the workers think and uh, because they themselves singly cannot articulate some of their requests or demands. Um, but at the same time, 
the unions were very important partners to the Singapore government because there were usually a lot of things, a lot of transformation and reforms that needed to be done. And this is particularly true as we um, transform our economy through the decades. And that uh, is the beginning of the trust building that has uh, gone on for so many years. So that every time when we have a uh, difficult transformation that we have to make because of technology uh, disruption or, or, or just the pure fact that we're no longer a cheap manufacturing base, um, you, you may get massive retrenchment. Uh, but because of the close working relationship, uh, it, it, it was a lot of um, sharing of the outlook, uh, helping to sort of find people, you know, replacement jobs. And, uh, and that close cooperation that really has, I would say, is a great underpinning of the Singapore economy itself. And um, how long do you think it's taken for the uh, Singapore economy to, to build from being a very basic trading economy to what it is, an industrialised mm -hmm. economy and uh, the most open economy mm -hmm. in the world, according to the right. figures? Um, I think the, the transformation has been gradual and it's planned for. Uh, the luxury that we have, uh, which I think not many countries now have, is that we, because of the single parties of uh, rule, we've been able to do long-term planning and we would always almost able to say what are the areas that we would have value to add and for which there will be uh, interested investors which are the areas that we really are losing our cost competitiveness. You worked with uh, Lee Kuan Yew. How did he approach it? How did he tackle this, this issue of um, building up an emerging economy? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that I feel extremely privileged to have had uh, some seven years of overlap with him. Uh, he, uh, I mean, he's, he's amazing. He, he, he used, I mean, he thinks and breathes Singapore. It's everything to him. Uh, the future, the, you know, what's wrong with the present, he moves on. He's extremely pragmatic about things. He doesn't sort of mull over what has gone wrong. You say, let's fix it. Let's look for a better way of doing it. Um, so he's extremely clear in his purpose. He's not easily distracted. Uh, he has views, he's very widely read. He has views. But he's also extremely open to views, suggestions, and, and so on. Um, I think that maybe it's not so obvious to a lot of people, but he, he is actually very open. Uh, I would describe him as a sponge. <laughs> he, he has a really curious mind, and, and he will just mop up new information. Yeah. And um, he must have been under severe pressure at times from his own people. I mean, often um, pushing people along a very high um, intensity capitalist path is mm -hmm. not always popular with the people. Mm -hmm. What happened when the pressure was on? Um, you know, a great leader uh, would be able to inspire a lot of people to take collective responsibility uh, with him and, and as well as to use their strengths to complement what you know, he has or may not have. And I, I think he does an extremely good job. He sets a really good example for future governments. Where do you think, um, if anywhere, maybe the Singapore economic miracle perhaps fell down or didn't quite deliver? At times, maybe we, we perhaps took a little longer than we should have in terms of adapting to a change. Um, but I would say that because we constantly check ourselves. Uh, I like to think that the, the damage uh, has so far been quite limited. You mentioned damage there. What do you mean by that exactly? In terms of like how you can grow uh, and sort of not realise that the infrastructure has not quite caught up with um, you know the needs of the growing population which is now not just the residential population but also the new workers who have come in. Mm, so some of these, uh, there, there are always, uh, you know, uh, things you can point out. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, but but these are some of the things that uh, the government sort of is quite uh, 
ceased with thinking about it on a daily basis. How has uh, Singapore ridden the, the, the world recessions we've had and financial crisis, um, and particularly the increased uh, fight for mm. foreign investors that every country is involved in mm -hmm. now? So we would have to, well, firstly, we were very we're completely exposed to the global economy because of uh, what we do. Um, so there's no running away from, let's say, the current trade war between the US and China. Uh, if there's going to be a global dampening of growth, we, we're going to feel it. Um, but in terms of competition for FDIs and so on, what we try to do is to again plan ahead to see which are the areas that we're losing our value at, which are areas that maybe we can do a little better. Um, and we recognize that nothing is permanent. So, but you, you just want to make sure you are slightly ahead all the time and that you have room for expansion and growth. And then you have to start thinking again about the next phase of growth. What lessons do you think the world can learn from Singapore? Oh, um, I would not want to presume that we, we can teach people <laughs> anything because our size and our geography is really quite different. Um, but it's almost, I think, the sense that the world doesn't owe you anything and nobody owes you a living is what we constantly are seized with. So we, have, we owe it to ourselves to think about our future and to plan for it as long as we can. So how you translate that, I mean, to each country, I think would depend very much on the politics of the day. So I'm talking to Hui Hua Lin, the former minister in the Prime Minister's Office of Singapore. Do stay tuned. The second half we'll be talking about South Africa, its state-owned enterprises, what the economy can do to transform, and also the thorny subject of corruption. Do stay tuned.